Chapter 6 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com. 6. Research There had been a council the night following the death of Harriet Lynn. Somehow the word had spread through the villages, and the chiefs had assembled in Jake's village. But they brought no solution, and in the long run had been forced to accept Doc's decision. I'm not going to retire and hide, he'd told them, surprised at his own decision, but grimly determined. You need me, and I need you. I'll move every day in hopes the lobby police won't find me, but I won't quit. Now he was packing the things he most needed and getting ready to move. The small bottles in which he was trying to grow his cultures would need warmth. He shoved them into an inner pocket and began surveying what must be left. He was heading for his tractor when another battered machine drove up. It had a girl of about fourteen with tears streaming down her face. She held out a pleading hand and her voice was scared. It's, it's Mama. Where? Leibniz. Leibniz was near enough. Doc started his tractor, motioning for the girl to lead the way. The little dwelling she led him to was at the edge of the village, looking more poverty-stricken than most. Chris Ryan and three of the medical lobby police were inside, waiting. The girl's mother was tied to the bed with a collection of medical instruments laid out, but apparently the threat had been enough. No actual injury had been inflicted. Probably none had been intended seriously. I knew you'd answer that kind of call, Chris said coldly. He grinned, sickly. They'd wasted no time. I hear it's more than you'll do, Chris. Congratulations. My patient died. You're lucky. She was certainly dead when my men took her picture. The print shows the death grimace clearly. Pretty. Frame it and keep it to comfort you when you feel lonely, he snapped. She struck him across the mouth with the handle of her gun. Then she twisted out through the door quickly, heading for the tractor that had been camouflaged to look like those used by the villagers. The three police led him behind her. A shout went up, and people began to rush onto the village street, but they were too late. By the time they reached Southport, Doc could see a trail of battered tractors behind, but there was nothing more the people could do. Chris had her evidence and her prisoner. Judge Ben Wilson might have been Jake's brother. He was older and grayer, but the same expression lay on his face. He must have been the family black sheep, since his father had been president of Space Lobby. Instead of inheriting the position, Wilson had remained on Mars, safely out of the family's way. He dropped the paper he was reading to frown at Chris. This the fellow? She began formal charges, but he cut them off. Your lawyer already had all that drawn up. I've been expecting you, doctor. Doctor, <laughs> you'd do a lot better home somewhere raising a flock of babies. Well, young fellow, so you're Feldman. Okay, your trial comes up day after tomorrow. Be ashamed to lock you in a Southport jail, a man of your importance. We'll just keep you here in the pending trial room. It's a lot more comfortable. Chris had been boiling slowly, and now she seemed to blow her safety valve. Judge Wilson, your methods are your own business in local affairs, but this involves Earth Medical Lobby. I demand... Tush, tush. The judge stared at her reprovingly. Young woman, you won't demand anything. This is Mars. If Space Lobby can stand me, I guess our friends over at Medical will have to. Or should I hold a trial right now and find Feldman innocent for lack of evidence? You wouldn't, Chris cried. Then her face sobered suddenly. I apologize. Medical is pleased to leave things in your hands, of course. Wilson smiled. Court's closed for today. Doc, I'll show you your cell. It's right next to my study, so I'm heading there anyhow. He began shucking his robe while Chris went out with the police, her voice sharp and continual. The cell was both reasonably escape-proof and comfortable, Doc saw, and he tried to thank the judge. But the old man waved it aside. Forget it. 
I just like to see that little termagant taken down. But don't count on my being soft. My methods may be a bit unusual. I always did like the courtroom scenes in the old books by that fellow Smith, but Space Lobby never had any reason to reverse my decisions. Anything you need? Sure, Doc told him, grinning in spite of his bitterness. Good biology lab and an electron microscope. Hmm, how about a good optical mic and some stains? Just got them in on the last shipment. Figure they were meant for you anyhow, since Jake Mullins asked me to order them. He went out and came back with the box almost at once. He snorted at Doc's incredulous thanks and moved off, his bedroom slippers slapping against the hard floor. Doc stared after him. If he were a friend of Jake, willing to invent some excuse to get a microscope here. But it didn't matter. Friend or foe, his death sentence would be equally fatal. And there were other things to be thought of now. The little microscope was an excellent one, though only a monocular. Doc's hands trembled as he drew his cultures out and began making up a slide. The sun offered the best source of light near the window, and he adjusted the instrument. Something began to come into view, but too faintly to be really visible. He remembered the stains, trying to recall his biology courses. More by luck than skill, his fourth try gave him results. Under 2,000 powers, he could just see details. There were dozens of cells in his impure culture, but only one seemed unfamiliar. It was a long, worm-like thing, sharpened at both ends, with the three separate nuclei that were typical of Martian life forms. Nearby were a host of little rod-like squiggles just too small to see clearly. Martian life. No Martian bug had ever proved harmful to men. Yet this was no mutated cell or virus from Earth. It was a new disease, completely different from all others. It was one where all Earth's centuries of experience with bacteria would be valueless. The first Martian disease. Unless this was simply some accidental contamination of his culture, not common to the other samples. He worked on until the light was too faint before putting the microscope aside. By the time the trial commenced, however... He was sure of the cause of the disease. It was Martian. Crude as his cultures were, they had proved that. The little courtroom was filled mostly from the villages. Lou was there, along with others he had come to know. Then the sight of Jake caught Doc's eyes. The darn fool had no business there. He could get too closely mixed into the whole mess. Court's in session, Wilson announced. Doc, you represented by counsel? Jake's voice answered, Your Honor, I represent the defendant. I think you'll find my credentials in order. Chris started to protest, but Wilson grinned. Never lost your standing in spite of that little fracas thirty years ago, so far as I know. But the police thought you were a witness when you came walking in. Figured you were giving up. I never said so, Jake answered. Chris was squirming angrily, but the florid man acting as counsel for the medical lobby shook his head, bending over to whisper in her ear. He straightened. No objection to counsel for the defense. We recognize his credentials. You're a fool, Matthews, the judge told him. Jake was smarter than half the rest of legal lobby before he went native. Still can tie your tail to a can. Okay, let's start things. I'm too old to dawdle. Doc lost track of most of what happened. This was totally unlike anything on Earth, though it might have been in keeping with the general casualness of the villages. Maybe the ritualistic routine of the lobbies was driving those who could resist to the opposite extreme. Chris was the final witness. Matthews drew comment of Feldman's former crime from her, and Jake made no protest, though Wilson seemed to expect one. Then she began sewing his shroud. There wasn't a fact that managed to emerge without slanting, though technically correct. Jake sat quietly, smiling faintly, and making no protests. He got up lazily to cross-examine Chris. Dr. Ryan, when Daniel Feldman was examined by the captain of the Navajo after arriving at Mars Station, did you identify him then as having been Dr. Daniel Feldman? She glanced at Matthews who seemed puzzled but unconcerned. That's correct, she admitted. But 
and you later saw him delivered to the surface of Mars. Is that also correct? When she assented, Jake hesitated. Then he frowned. What did you do then? Did you report him? Or send anyone to look after him, or anything like that? Certainly not, she answered. He was no... You did absolutely nothing about him after you identified him and saw him delivered here. You're quite sure of that. I did nothing. Jake stood quietly for a moment, then shrugged. No more questions. Matthews finished things in a plea for the salvation of all humanity from the danger of such men as Daniel Feldman. He was looking smug, as was Chris. Wilson turned to Jake. Has the defense anything to say? Few things, Your Honor. Jake stood up, suddenly looking certain and pleased. We are happy to admit everything factual the lobby had testified. Daniel Feldman performed a surgical operation on Harriet Lynn in the village of Einstein. But when has it been illegal for a member of the medical profession to perform an operation, even with small chance of success, within an accepted area for such operation? There has been no evidence adduced that any crime or act of even unethical conduct was committed. That brought Chris and Matthews to their feet. Wilson was relaxed again, looking as if he'd swallowed a whole cage of canaries. He banged his gavel down. Jake picked up two ragged and dog-eared volumes from his table. Case of Harding v. Southport, 2043, establishes that a lobby is responsible for any member on Mars. It is also responsible for informing the authorities of any criminal conduct on the part of its members or any former member known to it. Failure to report shall be considered an admission that the lobby recognizes the member as one in good standing and accepts responsibility for that member's conduct. At the time Daniel Feldman arrived, Dr. Christina Ryan was the highest appointed representative of medical lobby in Southport with full authority. She identified Feldman as having been a doctor without stipulating any change in status. She made no further report to any authority concerning Daniel Feldman's presence here. It seems obvious that Medical Lobby at Southport thereby accepted Daniel Feldman as a doctor in good standing for those who conduct the lobby accepted full responsibility. Wilson studied the book Jake held out and nodded. Seems pretty clear-cut to me, he agreed, passing the book on to Matthews. There's still the charge that Dr. Feldman operated outside a hospital. No reason he shouldn't, Jake said. He handed over the other volume. This is the charter for Medical Lobby on Mars. Medical Lobby agrees to perform all necessary surgical and medical services for the planet, though at the signing of this charter there was no hospital on Mars. Necessarily, Medical Lobby agreed to perform surgery outside of any hospital then. But to make it plainer, there's a later paragraph, page 181, that defines each hospital zone as extending not less than three nor more than 100 miles. Einstein is about 110 miles from the nearest hospital at Southport, so Einstein comes under the original charter provisions. Dr. Feldman was forced by charter provisions to protect the good name of his lobby by undertaking any necessary surgery in Einstein. He waited until Matthews had scanned that book, then took it back and began packing a big bag. Doc saw that his possessions and the microscope were already in the bag. The old man paid no attention to the arguments of Matthews before the bench. Abruptly, Wilson pounded his gavel. This court finds that Dr. Daniel Feldman is qualified to practice all the arts and skills of the medical profession on Mars, and that he acted ethically in the performance of his duties in the case of the deceased, Harriet Lynn he ruled. The costs of the case shall be billed to Medical Lobby of Southport. He took off his robe and moved rapidly toward his private quarters. Court was closed. Doc got up shakily, not daring to believe fully what he had heard. He started toward Jake, trying to avoid bumping into Chris, but she would not be avoided. 
She stood in front of him, screaming accusations and threats that reminded him of the only fight they'd ever had during their brief marriage. When she ran down, he finally met her eyes. "'You're a hell of a doctor,' he told her harshly. "'You spend all your time fighting me when there's a plague out there that may be worse than any disease we've ever known. Take a look at what lies under the black specks on your corpses. You'll find the first Martian disease. And maybe if you begin working on that now, you can learn to be a real doctor in time to do something about it. But I doubt it.' She fell back from him then. "'Research. You've been doing unauthorized research.' "'Prove it,' he suggested. "'But you'd be a lot smarter to try some yourself, "'and to hell with your precious rules.' "'He followed Jake out to the tractor. "'Surprisingly, the old man was sweating now. "'He shook his head at Doc's look, and his grin was uncertain. "'Matthews is an incompetent,' he said. "'They could have had you, Doc. "'That charter is so sloppy a man can prove anything by it. "'And building a hospital here did bring in Earth rules.' Wilson went out on a limb letting you go, but I guess we got away with it. Let's get out of here. Doc climbed into the tractor more soberly. They had escaped, this time. But there would be another time, and he was pretty sure that would be Chris's round. He had no intention of giving up his research. End Recording